This model is intended to introduce the course participants to the field of social policy. Its meaning, scope, and some of the debates around it. We elaborate on some anomalies and paradoxes in some current discussions of social policy. We will explore the broader understanding and framing of social policy, especially as it may apply in the African context. And from the perspective of diverse policy pioneers in the domain of public policy. The model emphasizes the inherent, inherent inscription of power relations at the heart of any social policy framework. The model highlights in the context of the political economy of social policy, how social policy designs and development are immensely gendered. It is expected that by the end of the model, the participants will have gained a robust insight into the subject matter of social policy and be able to identify the diversity of social policy instruments and the modes of their mobilization for enhancing human well-being for development planning. Can I ask a sort of obvious question? What is social policy? And it's interesting you're asking that here at the annual conference of the Social Policy Association because it's a, it's a question that's been asked in at least two of the sessions that I've been to. I think a lot of uh, people both studying social policy and seeking to implement social policy as they were doing social policy in, in the world would say that it's, it's about promoting welfare and well-being. It's about how we make the lives of all of the citizens in our country uh, how we make it possible for them to live safe, fulfilling, healthy lives, how we make it possible for them, for them to achieve what they want to do within their lives. And that's often captured in this notion of welfare and well-being. So what we're studying when we study social policy is we're studying how uh, we deliver welfare and well-being to people. What that turns into in practice, actually, is, is a number of different ways in which we conceive of the issue of welfare. What do we mean by it? For example, uh, it presumably includes health. Uh, what do we mean by good health? Uh, can we define health? Can we measure health? And then what, would, what, uh, what do we do to try and promote good health? So you end up then uh, moving from the very general notion of what you study to look at particular aspects of policy development and policy delivery. So in a, a social policy student will study things like the, the National Health Service, how it's developed, how it's changed, how it operates. They will study education systems, the role of education for school children, and then how education is taken forward uh, into later life, what they call these days lifelong learning. Uh, increasingly important to recognise that education isn't just something that happens to kids at school. Uh, they will study how we provide for people's material needs, how we provide for housing, how we provide uh, transport and other environmental factors. Uh, and of course, in particular, how we provide uh, people with the, with the wherewithal to meet their own material needs. In other words, the question of the distribution of resources, particularly cash resources, people's incomes, the social security that can help to support or replace the incomes that they might lose. So we study a series th those different policy areas and how they're implemented and how they've been developed and how they're implemented in practice. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when we're studying that, uh, there's often an assumption, I think, uh, in, particularly when people start out studying social policy, that you're mainly then looking at what the state and the government does. In other words, social policy is about delivering welfare for citizens, and it's the government that does that, and they do it predominantly through the public agencies like the National Health Service. But actually, of course, when you begin to look at how social policy is played out uh, in the world, it's not just what government does that makes us uh, that contrib contributes to our welfare. Uh, our welfare is developed uh, and is improved and is enhanced by a range of different agencies, which includes 
private and commercial agencies providing, for example, uh, uh, providing us, you know, the people who make the glasses that we wear to help us to see. Uh, the, the different, uh, a right, wide range of voluntary and community agencies who contribute uh, in a number of different areas, including a much of the provision of social care for people who can't look after themselves or who need assistance in looking after themselves are provided by voluntary agencies. So it's what we do on a voluntary basis uh, for each other. But also, actually, and probably the, 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 un, the most unsung area, is what happens informally, in informal relationships between individual citizens. And an awful lot of our welfare we actually do on, on a more or less face-to-face, -face, certainly person-to-person -person basis, and of course in particular through the family and the importance of the family and different family structures and different family shapes that, that aren't all the same, but, but the role of those informal relationships. So it's not just about what happens in the NHS, and indeed it's not just about what people in government and policy makers say. Uh, the implementation of social policy covers uh, a wide range of relationships that, that, that start perhaps uh, with, the, with the formal and governmental but also include the informal, the family, the community, the voluntary and so on. In the clip that we've just seen, <clears throat> Peter Arcock, Professor Peter Arcock was asked the question, what is social policy? And he responded by saying social policy is, I quote, about promoting welfare and well-being. It is about how we make the life of all the citizens in our country, how we make it possible for them to live safe, fulfilling, healthy lives. How we make it possible for them to achieve what they want to do with their lives and, and that is often captured within the notion, and that this is often captured within the notion of welfare and well-being, in the quote. It goes on to elaborate the specific liquid uh, examples uh, as this throws up the question of the different ways in which we delivered welfare, you know, well-being of people uh, in parts of social policy and so on. In Peter Cox's conception, therefore, social policy is concerned with promoting welfare and well-being in what would be considered an expansive framing of social policy, ACO covered the range of services, health, education, housing, and the ways in which transport, and the ways in which social policy is delivered, state institutions, voluntary agencies, private uh, organization, um, but it, you know, informal uh, provisioning, uh, through face-to-face -face inter face -face interaction that happens at the level of the family. Social policy is the name given to a field of study as well as what the field studies. Social policy as a field is concerned with the study of human well-being. Social policy entails the study of the social relations and institutions necessary for human well-being and the systems by which well-being may be promoted or for that matter impaired. Dean Hartley Dean will insist that social policy has its focus on people's well-being. Dean expressed a preference for well-being rather than welfare. This, he argues, is because, and I quote, well-being is about how well people are, not how well they do. In other words, well-being is about, quote, the essence of their lives, much more than welfare or how people are faring, their goings and doings, in quote. To return to Arcock. Um, to return to Arcock. Um, the study of social policy is the study of how we deliver well-being 
and welfare to people, covering ideas or issues of healthcare, education, transport and housing, among other things. It also involves the study of the distribution of the resources to ensure income security. In terms of how, who does it? ACOC would suggest that social policy is delivered by government and state institution, by voluntary agencies, um, goes on to mention informal provisioning, um, and, and so on and so forth. However, we'll find out a significant part of social policy is delivered through private sector or the market. Um, several of the mechanisms for ensuring the well-being of people come as part of the employment package. Health insurance, for instance, uh, support for education expenses, uh, retirement, and so on and so forth, which come as part of employment benefits. In what we will refer to as the conventional wisdom in social policy, it is not unusual to come across the conception of social policy as a deliberate intervention by the state to distribute resources amongst the citizens to achieve a welfare objective. And that's quoting from John Baldock. A welfare system is defined as the range of institutions that together determine the welfare of its citizens. It is generally considered as public policy matters that involve deliberate state policy, which could be in the form of direct public and state provision of services or resources, transfers in kind or cash, or public policy in the forms of law and regulations that define private provisioning. The institutional mechanism for provisioning are generally considered to be the state, market, and family. Voluntary organizations may be contracted by government to deliver services on its behalf. Baldock and, and, and others you know, suggest that, and I quote, the classic examples of social policies are the activities of government in providing money or services to their citizens in five main areas, social protection, benefit, often known as social security, health services, housing provision, personal services. The list of the main areas that Baldock highlights privilege social protection in terms of exposed protection from vulnerability, uh, discounting for educational services. Indeed, the OECD experts who compiled the statistics on social protection expenditure exclude education because they argue government do not provide education to, pro to provide support during circumstances which adversely affect people's welfare, end of quote, but rather as a form of social investment. Good end. In these areas, public spending, start of quote, and private social spending, end of quote, as distinct from, quote, exclusively private spending, are considered social policy. Publicly mandated spending on provision of healthcare and private expenditure on health insurance, for instance, will be regarded as a matter of social policy but out of pocket health spending may not. The problem there here is that out of pocket expenditure, for instance, in the area of health, and its size in total health expenditure is a function of how health financing is organized within the policy, social policy framework. Co-payments either in publicly mandated health systems or private insurance is a result of the decision on how a health system is to be financed. Similarly, 
issues ranging from the organization of the labor market, including active labor market policies, to public mass transit or transport that will be considered components of social policy in some other framings are missing from the classical examples provided by Baldock. We shift to anomalies and paradoxes in conventional thinking around social policy. Despite the general awareness of the diversity of the instruments involved in social policy and modality for its delivery, the field of study has tended to focus on the state of the market as the source of, of provisioning. Related to this has been the excessive privileging of income support and income maintenance dimensions of social policy. This tends to overinflate the social protection component of social policy. Despite the clear awareness of the broader understanding of social policy by some of the leading scholars whose work tend towards this direction, the privileging of income maintenance social policy instrument has the unintended result of narrowing the vision of social policy. An example is the bulk of the work around the building of typologies or taxonomies of welfare regime. Despite the very robust understanding of social policy that will come from the work of uh, scholars such as Gusta Espin Anderson, for instance, the primary component for the cluster analysis by which the welfare state regime typology is derived are old age, pension, sickness, and unemployment benefits. Despite the immense value of Espin Anderson's work in this area, social policy instruments used are mainly those concerned with income maintenance or income support, a component of social protection tasks of social policy. You will know that these are a much smaller area of things than, than what Alcock, Dean, and Baldock uh, highlighted as matters for social policy. For a time, typology building along the lines of Espen Anderson came to dominate the field of social policy with a predominantly similar focus on limited set of social policy instruments, often mainly social protection types, construct in the construction of the typologies. These works had the unintended and unfortunate effect of narrowing the focus of social policy as a field of study and a domain of public policy. This is despite the analysts themselves being aware that social policy is far more than income support or income maintenance. We will return to these issues of typology in module, module three. We're emphasizing, we're emphasizing the anomalies and paradoxes in the conventional orientation towards social policy in the, in the field to alert development planners to their implication for development as social policy architecture, to the development of a social policy architecture within the context of development planning. Some of the discussions may come across as akin, but being aware of them is crucial in orienting participants towards what we will call a wider vision of social policy. We are aware that there are other components of social policy literature that will come across that will that you will come across that will take for granted the perspective which we consider uh, anomalous. Gustav Esmin Anderson's typology of welfare state regimes, in other words, how the provision of welfare is organized at a macro level, puts a significant premium on the idea of decommodification. As Espen Anderson argues, decommodification occurs when services is rendered as a matter of right and when a person can maintain a livelihood without reliance on markets. This involves this 
This involves emancipating individuals from market dependence. As Additional argues, the idea of decommodification may fail to account for what makes something a commodity and what happens at the point at which services are offered without demanding payment at the point of consumption. Further, it may not adequately capture the norms that underpin the welfare regimes where decommodification is at its highest, the social democratic regime. First, the core normative basis for the social democratic regime is the injunction that everyone who can work must work within the framework of from each according to their ability and to each according to their needs, end of quote. Full employment is a significant underpinning of social democratic regimes. The idea that one can slack off, avoid engaging in market relations or employment and seek to benefit from the collective resources provided by society will be considered an anathema in a social democratic context. This is an important insight to keep in mind when we consider social policy in the context of development. Social expenditure, even public spending, is viewed as a means of social investment rather than the expenditure side of the budget. Second, in the context of universal provisioning of social services, for example, healthcare or education, why money may not exchange hands at the point at which the service is provided or is consumed, this does not mean that it is free service. Put differently, there's nothing like free healthcare or free education. Someone is paying for the service. This, or, 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 or you have to finance it uh, in, in particular ways. This brings to the fore a planner's preoccupation with the financing of social policy. You may finance it through social insurance, budget allocation, sovereign wealth, but you have to worry about how you finance your social policy. More often than not, in the context of tax finance, social policy, the tax system may be progressive, but the bulk of the financing is from the labor income side. Essentially, that's the insight between the, the labor income, wages, and profits on, this, on the corporation side. Uh, the bulk of the financing is from the labor income side of that equation. Essentially, what society does is to pool resources to finance social policy expenditure. A different issue of the anomalies and paradoxes in the conventional view of social policy is the idea of social citizenship which is used to signal that the entitlement to services and income support is based on citizenship. This is supposed to be an idea borrowed from T.H. Marshall's view of the historical evolution of the forms of citizenship from civic to political and social. As additional noted, Marshall's concept of the social face of the evolution of citizenship was not about a different type of citizenship from citizenship grounded in civic and political rights. The stage of the development of citizenship in which social rights become widespread was not about a different type of citizenship. The core value of Marshall's proposed proposal you know, is the deepening of the quality of citizenship. Significantly, access to social policy entitlement may vary, but there is hardly any country where access to entitlement is restricted only to citizens. Citizenship is only part of the story in terms of coverage. Non-citizens with permanent or temporary right of residence, refugees, etc., are typically granted some form of entitlement to social provisioning. Again, this is something that planners have to keep in mind. Often this becomes clearer later. The tendency within the field of social policy and for social policy activities, activists to insist on the sanctity of the normative justification and to condemn the idea of social policy instrument as a means to an end, what is called the instrumentalizing 
of social policy. In other words, social policy, that social policy should be valued purely for the norms of social justice that underpin it, rather than the idea that social policy instrument can be used to sub support other socioeconomic projects. This is something of a paradox in that even the norms of social justice that may underpin social policy are not an end in themselves. They are a means to another objective, people's well-being and the capacity to live a dignified life. The argument that normative justification for social policy occupies a separate domain of values distinct from instrumentalizing social policy would be patently absurd in such cases. The normative underpinning of offering people adult literacy may be to enhance the quality of their participation in private and public life. If you can read and write, you do not need somebody else in the village to read for you the letters that your children in the city send to you or be privy to your private thoughts in writing your letters to your children. But literacy is an end to other things. Most progressive social policy architectures ground social policy in the humane norms to achieve different ends. Again, this is important in framing social policy in the context of development. Conventional perspective of social policy can also easily miss the point about employment, decent work. Is that the, the, the point that employment, in other words, decent work is a primary enabler of individual and societal welfare and well being. It is easy to ignore the fact that full employment or efforts towards it was a primary pillar of Second World War welfare state design. And we move to the issues of the biases in the field. Mkandawire highlighted four concerns and biases in the conventional field of social policy, which undermine the dialogue between social policy literature and development literature. This include the excessive bias of the field to the OECD experience of social policy, especially in the post-World War period. Much of the social policy writing and attempts to disseminate it read of what seems to be done from our OECD experience, especially those of Europe and its diaspora. Second, the field tends to be marred by aesthetic comparative approach, a tendency to compare different social policy models at a point in time. Third is that is what Mkandawiri refers to as the linear view, which involves a focus on welfare regimes as endpoints. Much less attention is paid to the journey from the inception to the current state. For development planners, the more interesting question will be to understand the questions that the policymakers were asking and how they sought to answer the questions when they design particular social policy instruments or design their social policy architecture. The idea of welfare regimes as a state of culmination does not allow for lessons that can be learned in context, <clears throat> the context of the social problems that the policymakers were seeking to address. On the other hand, the development literature seems caught up in what may be called the development bias, where every scant attention is where very scant attention is paid to the welfare literature and the misconception that policy, social policy is what you do when you are developed. This is the anomalous idea that you first need to bake the cake before you think of sharing it. And the idea that social policy is primarily about redistribution. The effect is to produce an image of social policy that is focused on social protection, a misreading of the European experience of social policy 
as being primarily concerned with social protection matters. A final point is methodological. And this is the methodological overemphasis on social spending in estimating social expenditure, social policy expenditure, or creating cluster of social policy models. This fails to account for other sources of social policy uh, expenditure that may be employment-based, uh, for instance, or organized in informal uh, networks. So we move to what we we'll call social policy unbound. In other words, a more expansive understanding of social policy. So let us return to the question, what is social policy? Taking into consideration the anomalies, paradoxes, and biases in the field, and work towards an understanding of social policy more attuned to the context in which the country is engaged in, the de in development efforts. Additional defines social policy as the collective public effort at affecting and protecting the social well-being of people within a given territory. The definition is intended to address many things concerning social policy uh, coverage. First, the collective public efforts concerns the fact that social policy is a public effort at securing and protecting human well-being, which is more than the isolated individual efforts. Individual and private efforts to ensure well-being will not be considered a component of social poli policy. However, the design of a country's social policy architecture may explain the preponderance of individual private efforts to secure well-being. Second, social policy is not only about protecting human well-being. It is about creating the conditions that prevent the situations and the conditions that undermine human well-being in the first instance. In other words, ex ante facilitation of the conditions for securing human well-being. Third, the accent on public efforts public offers a, a broader perspective beyond simply what the state does. Social policy instruments can be developed within the context of community efforts, civil society, employment conditions, and the use of the market as well as the public authorities or the state. The focus on people, on people within a given territory shift the attention away from citizenship as the base for access to instruments that facilitate human well-being. A given territory may range from sub-national to national and regional uh, levels. Social policy is not restricted to national or country level facilitation of human well-being. Social policy, it should be noted, is concerned with addressing the social question in society. It remits goes beyond income support or income maintenance to include the usual services like education, healthcare, housing, transport, and labor market. Uh, these are standard issues that will be considered the domain of social policy. Beyond these, however, will be issues such as land and agrarian reform and affirmative action equity policy. While outside Southern Africa, land may not be a significant public concern, agrarian reform is. Land reform is generally understood as an instrument to enhance the productivity and quality of life for people in rural farming communities, especially where land reform is of the land to the tillers variety or land reform uh, or land or to land reform beneficiaries. Land reform needs to be supported by agrarian reforms to increase the productivity and quality of life of farming communities. In contexts where land reform is not a policy objective, agrarian reform and support will still be a social policy concern with a focus on enhancing rural farming productivity and enhancing well being. Similarly, affirmative action or equity is concerned with improving the well being of the affected marginalized communities in terms of access to economic, social, and political resources for improved well-being. All these are matters that should concern development planners in terms of what should frame and go 
into the plans. Social policy instruments are generally framed by regulations, rules, norms, and institutions that govern their production, allocation, and eligibility criteria for accessing the instrument. Healthcare may be provided by publicly mandated institutions, voluntary organizations on their own on behalf of the state, or for-profit private firms, or a mix of all the three. Access may be universally confirmed regardless of an individual's ability to pay. Access could be defined by subscription to private health insurance schemes, targeted exemption from payment in public health facilities for specific categories of the population, or a mix of all this. The normative underpinning of the provision and access to such services and the portion of the population covered by specific rules of eligibility will shape what we refer to as a territory, a territory social policy architecture. In other words, it is the normative underpinning of a territory social policy framed by the fact of one being human with a dominant accent on collective public provisioning of services. Alternatively, is the dom dominant normative tone, one of reliance on markets as the first port of call in seeking social provisioning, and that public provisioning should be offered only in the context of demonstrable inability by an individual to provide for himself or herself. And then we move to the concerns of social policy. Nkandawire has argued that social policy is concerned, and I quote, with the redistributive effect of economic policy, the protection of people from the vagaries of market and the changes circumstances of age, of life, the enhancement of productive potential of member society and the reconciliation of the burden of reproduction with that of other tasks. This will be considered the redistributive protection, production, and reproduction task of social policy. Additional has argued that in addition to these four concerns and tasks of social policy, the role of social policy in enhancing social cohesion or nation building is particularly evident in many post-colonial African contexts. Among these concerns of social policy are how the prosper proceeds, benefits of economic policy are distributed in society. How we protect people from the adversities and vagaries of operating in the market and the life circumstances from infant to old age. Social policy is also concerned with how we improve the productive capacity of people in society and how we ensure that the burden of reproduction is equitably shared and does not become a hindrance to women's participation in the full range of opportunities available in a society. Finally, social policy is also concerned with how we ensure social cohesion in society across class, ethnic, religious, gender, and other lines of social fractures. In, other, in another sense, social policy is concerned with nation building, with the nation building objective. All these tasks involve the enhancement of human well-being and are essential factors that should be on, on that should underpin the development process and about which planners should be aware of. In other words, especially in the specific context of this course, uh, you know, building a post-pandemic uh, uh, era of, of inclusivity, uh, resilience, and sustainability. Let us take the issue of education as an example. Understood as a form of social investment, equitable and public provisioning of education will be critical in building human resources capacity 
and an enabling factor in powering development. Equally, investment in the quality of education for the current generation will improve the life chances of the beneficiaries. With a growing economy, investment in education of the current generation will in all probability enhance their earning capacity relative to the generation of their parents, which offers ex ante protection from vulnerability. Investment in education of the young women will improve their ability to engage meaningfully in social and economic activities. Policies that promote socialization of care, support for maternal care, child care, an equitable sharing of household chores, etc., will ensure that a woman's biological reproductive role does not compromise or undermine her ability to engage in the full range of the of available social and economic opportunities in society. Equally as well, access to education services can be designed in such a way that it promotes social cohesion and nation building. Publicly funded and available education can bridge the class divide. The provision of education and admission policies can be de designed in such a way that students from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds are educated together. This may have the effect of displacing solidarity, solitary ethnic and religious identities and enhancing a sense of national identity beyond ethnic and religious affiliation. Two examples of designing access to education for nation building purposes are in Nigeria and Tanzania. In the aftermath of the 1967 and 1970 civil war in Nigeria, an assessment of the cost of the civil war was that there was limited contact between people in different parts of the country. This little contact undermined the development of national identity. The federal government in the country established several schools called federal government colleges across the country. Admission to these colleges involved a requirement that the student must be drawn from across the different geographical parts of the country. This will allow the students from different ethnic backgrounds spend five to seven years together uh, within boarding facilities. At the end of the secondary education period, the hope was that students will have developed a pan-Nigerian identity and affiliation beyond their different ethnic backgrounds. Similarly, in the 1960s and 1970s, Tanzania developed a model of recruiting students into secondary schools. The model often involved the recruiting students from say the southern region of the country to be educated and interact with communities in the northern parts of areas of the country. In addition to education serving <clears throat> as a social policy device for building human resource capacity of the country and ensuring ex ante protection against vulnerability, these cases involve the design of education in advancing social cohesion and nation building uh, objective. And then we we'll move to the prophylactic nature of you know, what it is designed for prophylactic social policy. Rather than merely a set of policy instruments intended to protect uh, exposed against vulnerability, Ava and Gunnar Milda have argued that for what they refer to as prophylactic social policy. In Gunnar Milda's words, these are policies and social reforms, I quote, advocated in terms of being preventive or prophylactic, i.e. saving the individual or society from future costs and, or, and or increasing future productivity, end of quote. In other words, social policy is concerned with preventing vulnerability instead of merely responding to vulnerability and external shocks. A critical aspect of this is social policy framing, which understand that it is it, which understand it as a social investment rather than simply expenditure. Uh, it is essential to know 
that this is not merely how a Swedish sociologist and social economist thought about social policy. This was the way several post-colonial African countries, you know, and leaders understood social policy. The provision of adult literacy services was not merely a drain on the fiscals, but an investment in making older people persons active participants in the social, economic, and political lives of the, of the society. It was about enhancing the quality of their lives and citizenship. Public health provision was not seen as merely the expenditure side of the budget, but as investing in the health of the citizens and the residents in the country, which makes them healthy and, and more productive. Education was seen as part of the strategy for waging the war on poverty and ignorance, improving the quality of people's lives while contributing to human resources need of the longer term development process. Social policy is not merely a technical issue or even significantly a technical matter. Social policy and the architectural framing of its coverage eligibility criteria for access to provisioning are fundamental areas of you know, value commitment. They are generally a result of the value of what is considered the good society. Framing of the value content of the provision of healthcare will define how we organize health services, how they are accessed, how we pay for it. One normative principle is that a person's right to life and quality living should not depend on the size of the person's pocket. The idea of a good society will be one in which people are valued as people and in their own right. Alternatively, the normative notion that a good society is one in which individuals function and freely engage in economic activities unhindered by any external agent or force will produce a different orientation to the provision of healthcare and access to the services. In this context, healthcare will be treated like any other business activity and access will depend on the market-based resources available to the individual. A concession may be made for people who are considered deserving the deserving poor, those who can be demonstrably identified as without the capacity to care for themselves. For this category of people, segregated social provisioning of healthcare may be offered. The latter is considered evidence of a residual social policy. In other words, the social policy architecture that takes the market as the primary basis in which social needs are met, but which indicates that public provisioning can be offered in cases of market failure. One system seeks the promotion of equality and social solidarity. The other systems aim to sustain and maintain existing social hierarchies. Also, norms around gender inform how we make sense of a social policy. Indeed, it is best to think of every social policy framework as fundamentally structured by gender norms. In cases where the gender norm is that it is the role of women to provide care and nurture, social policy is generally designed to keep women within the domestic context and define men primarily as breadwinners. In this context, it is generally in the relations that women have with men that they are offered access to social provisioning, in other words, as wives and as daughters. Alternatively, 
the social norms of equal equally or what or, or that seeks to promote equality equality you know you know alternative the social norms of equality or one that seeks to promote equality between men and women will offer access to men and women based on their being human beings, not based on their socially ascribed values. Education will be provided to boys and girls based on equity. Specific steps will be taken to construct social policy regime in a way that accounts for women's reproductive burden and the socialization of the burden of care. Extended maternity and paternity leaves are offered to people in employment and early childhood care, childhood education and care services are provided to allow mothers to enter and return to the labor market. The eventual features of a social policy architecture reflect the dominant cultural and political characteristics of society in the development and design of social policy architecture. Development planners need to be aware that constructing a social policy architecture requires normative coherence, which is sustained by the underlying norms of society. In this regard, we will understand that social policy framework will be of three distinct types residual in the sense that we discussed earlier, that the market is the dominant means for securing social provision. Only in the context of market failure does the public authority offer any support for individuals. Palliative, in the sense that social policy on offer is about mitigating adverse social and economic circumstances rather than overcoming them. Transformative, in the sense that the purpose of social policy is not merely to maintain existing social order, but transform the economy, social institution, and social relations. This is generally guided by the imperative of advancing equality and building social solidarity. Now we shift our attention to the political economy of social policy. Political economy holding argues rests, and I quote, upon the realization that the production and distribution of wealth must be studied simultaneously with the operation of political power, end of quote. The core concern for political economy offer, the core concern that political economy you know, offer, you know, offer the most consistent and rigorous approach available to address the core concerns of social policy. The differences that we observe in national social policy architecture say a lot about embedded power relations in society. Observed social policy architectures are products of intense contestations of power and ideas of what constitutes the good society. The ability to push through particular forms of social policy design, how services are produced, rules of how such services may be accessed, etc., reveal a lot about the balance of power among contending social forces in the formulation of social policy measures. A lot about power relation in society and the politics of power derives from how production and distribution of wealth occur in society. This can manifest in the different domains of social relations and the operations of power. We can identify six domains of power relations in society, gender, class, ethnicity, race, religion, and regional. Class relations are more closely associated with the production and distribution of wealth. The vertical structuration of society generates interests that play out and are defended in the framing of social policy measures. There is, of course, no one-to-one -one association between class relations of class location of actors and the interests they will pursue. Other domains of power that need to be addressed on their own terms rather than being seen as simple reflections 
on the manifestation of class relations are gender, race, nationality, religious, and regional. Gender power relations cut across the different domains of, of power relations. As argued in the previous section, gender norms are vital in the framing of social policy measures and the social policy architectures. Also, race and ethnicity have been central in the determination of what social policy services can be accessed by which group or what rates at what rate and on what terms. Racial hierarchies and power relations have been fundamental in colonial and settler colonial environments for determining whether people from different population groups can access social services, receive social benefit, and on what terms. Similarly, there have been historical contexts in which religious affiliation generates different rules for accessing social services and benefits. Regional locations also affect the distribution and capacity of residents to access social services. Social policy frameworks underpinned by the norms of equality will be framed by the need to overcome the burden of initial social condition and differences. Alternatively, social policy that is underpinned by the norms of sustaining different power relations will support entitlement and access to social services, social resources, and benefits that affirm the differences in power location. The widely understood varieties of social policy architectures have historically reflected the dynamics of power relations in their respective societies. While motivated by demands of industrialization and averting the threat of revolution in Germany in the second half of the 19th century, what is generally referred to as the Bismarckian social policy model reflects the power relations in German society at the time, the dominance of social conserv conservatism of the church, the aristocracy and the upper middle classes. The social insurance system established at the time retained the privileges of social hierarchies in society within social insurance contributions from employees and employers. The social reforms efforts of the government of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, generally referred to as the New Deal, was shaped and limited by the traditional dominance of social conservatism and big business in the United States. The reform process itself, which involved considerable amount of social police policy measures, was shaped by the fiscal conservatism of Roosevelt himself. The limit of what could be achieved under the program was shaped by federalism, different allocations of power between federal, states, and local governments, and the ability of various segments of society of the society to mobilize judicial and power resources. Social policy frameworks that emerged in the United Kingdom in the immediate post-World War environment, generally referred to as the Beveridgean model, reflected the emerging power of the labor movement and social progressives in the United Kingdom and the significant election victory of the Labour Party in 1945. For a time, the balance of forces had shifted in the direction of progressive social forces, inspired mainly by the war economy and the social solidarity within the UK in the war against Nazi Germany. The Nordic welfare regime, as Walter Copy and Espen Anderson have argued, developed in the context which reflected the balance of political forces between organized labor, capital, and rural farmers. The Nordic model in particular reflected the mobilization of intellectual and social democratic forces with the capacity for visionary agenda setting. Alva and Gunnar Meldal, two people we referred to earlier, were key, key players for the 19, from the 1930s in helping to shape the direction of the social policy reforms with a focus on the transformation of the economy 
and gender relations. What we refer to as the nationalist model of social policy reflects the power relations within the different post-colonial contexts, the political dominance of the political parties that led the anti-colonial struggle, the vision of socioeconomic transformation, the anti-colonial social compact, and the coalition of social forces behind the alliance, the limitations of the model and the subsequent rolling back of the social policy achievements, especially in the post-1980 era, reflect the coalition of international and local forces that underpin the structural adjustment program. As we have emphasized throughout the model, this model, the dominant gender norms in a society tend to shape a social policy framework. A social policy designed based on the assumption of gender hierarchy and that women bear the sole responsibility for the care and nurturing will frame and organize a social policy provisioning differently from a prevailing norm or normative aspiration concerned with gender equality. The Bismarckian model was defined by an overt gender assumption in which men are breadwinners and women are mainly outside the labor market. This gender norm is even more pronounced in societies dominated by conservative religious organizations. Why not as overt as the Bismarckian model? The Beveridgean model equally has hidden gender norms that assume that the primary income earner is the male head of the family. In many ways, the nationalist model, despite its commitment to the deployment of social policy for a significant socioeconomic transformation and enhancement of human well-being, was often passive in addressing gender hierarchies and norms. The Nordic model is perhaps the social policy framework that explicitly sought to address gender inequality and generate a new gender norm. The social policy measures within the model deliberately sought to remove the obstacles to women's labor market participation and create the dual inner labor market model. The former involves extended periods of paid maternity leave, the promotion of shared care rules through affording men as husband and fathers paternity leave, and the socialization of care through publicly provided early childhood education facilities. The latter refers to a situation where both spouses earn incomes from labor market participation. It is of course possible to have dual earner model where women are still paid less than men. In the social policy context frame by male breadwinner norms, women will in effect subsidize the employee unit through unpaid domestic care work. Significantly as well, the reproduction of labor power and the production of a new generation of workers takes place within the domestic con context in which women mostly carry the burden of such reproduction of labor power. As development planners, you should be aware of the underlying gender norms of social policy that you design and which underpin your development plan. Thank you.